Luke 16, I'm going to read from verse 1 to 15, and I'm going to read from the ESV, which is the English Standard Version. Okay. He, that's Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to him, or rather, and the manager said to himself, what shall I do since the master since my master is taking the management away from me. I'm, no, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their homes, into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth or unrighteous mammon, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you who have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. So, this is one of the more difficult of Jesus' parables, perhaps. The parable of the dishonest and shrewd manager. What an interesting story. Okay, you have the master and you have the manager. And the master gets to hear that the manager has been dishonest. Hauls him before him and says, charges have been brought against you for wasting my possessions. 
what is this I hear about it? And there's a silence, if you notice. He asks a question, and the unjust, unrighteous manager says nothing. His silence pretty much tells of his guilt. And he makes no defense, which is slightly unusual. I think his guilt is beyond doubt. The master knows he's got good information. He's accurate in his assessment of the dishonesty of his servant or the manager. And the master is just and righteous in dismissing him. But in a way, he's merciful too. He could have him brought into prison until he's paid off everything. Anyway, that's, you can consider that. And then, <laughs> before he actually brings all the books to his master, the dishonest manager considers his options. And he has to consider them fast. What am I going to do? How am I going to secure my long-term well-being? How can my future be secure? How can I remain connected? That's what he thinks to himself. And then he carries out his plan very quickly. He calls in two of those to whom his master, or, or two who rent out land, or um, debtors who owe his master money. And one by one, privately, on a face-to-face -face basis, not publicly, he acts very shrewdly and individually gets them to rewrite a, a, a different accounting of what they owe. He gets them to do it. He gets them to write it down. It's very, very shrewd. If you think this, if any of you are business-minded here and you really understand what's being said, it's very, very shrewd business management and very, very dishonest. Okay? He carries out his plan. And then in verse 8, the big surprise comes where Jesus says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. He did not commend the dishonest manager for his dishonesty. Understand it, all right? <laughs> but quite often, Jesus will pull things out, what's the word in English, there's a word for it, you make it an extreme, you exaggerate to make a point. Hyperbole, thank you, that's what I was looking for. And I think he's doing that here. So, great surprise from the master to commend this dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Okay, now the, sh the word shrewd here is the Greek word phronimus. I probably haven't pronounced that correctly. Phronimus, but it means sensible, prudent, practically wise, down to earth. Basically, I think you could say down to earth, practical wisdom. All right. And then Jesus says, very interestingly, he says, for the sons of this world, in other words, the people of the world, the world system that is not to be commended, right? But nevertheless, he says, the people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Now, we are the sons of light. Jesus is the light of the world. We are the sons of light. And Jesus is saying, look, 
you need to learn something even from the dishonesty of the world. Not to be dishonest, but there is a way to be shrewd that you need to be to redeem unrighteous mammon. Okay? Wealth, the wealth of this world, is unrighteous. And it will fail. Make no, make no doubt about it. But it can be made use of for something that is righteous and is unfailing and lasts forever. Praise God. Isn't that amazing? When used properly. Shrewdness in the story, think about it, in the parable Jesus told, shrewdness led the dishonest manager to find a way to secure his future in the face of losing everything. In a way, we face something not dissimilar. This world and all that is in it, including our bodies, is on the way out. It's failing. It's under the death penalty, basically. It is. God said, when you choose a different path to mine, you will die. But the dishonest manager... In this parable, he exercised foresight and practical wisdom. And that's what Jesus is drawing our attention to. So how do we use worldly wealth to make eternal friends? Well, you invest in the kingdom of God. You invest in the kingdom that will not perish or pass away. That has God as its king, not Satan, basically. To put it bluntly. All right? Set your hearts and your minds on how to be generous. Ask the master, ask the Lord to direct your investments in his kingdom, your giving your offerings, and then you will have eternal riches, says the Lord Jesus. This can include tithing. I'm not going to talk too much about tithing today, but tithing is a biblical and a fundamental principle of the kingdom of, of God. Tithing is a giving, well, actually, more accurately, a tithing is a returning of the 10% that you receive back to God. It's a first fruits principle. We give back to God the first of what we receive because the first of what we receive is holy. It belongs to God anyway. I'll just make mention, it, there's a lot that could be said about tithing, but Genesis 14, you see this spiritual principle introduced when Abraham gave Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of Jerusalem, the tenth of the plunder he, he received following his victory over the alliance of kings. And there's something very deep and spiritual actually in that. Abraham, of course, is our father of faith. And he's the pattern for all believers in a number of ways. And I believe tithing is one of them. It's not just tithing. Offerings are our free will giving out of a, a free will and a generous heart. And both tithes and offerings when given in the right way, connect us to God's kingdom economy and disconnect us 
from that of the world, especially from the sinful influence that worldly riches and money can exert very easily if you're not connected to God's economy and values. Okay? And you know, if you're not properly connected to God's economy and you are compromising and have some inordinate connection with the world's economy by basically means of loving money, <laughs> all right, it will breed insecurity. It will breed control out of that insecurity and fear and greed. All manner of things come out of being wrongly connected in your heart to the supply of what you need on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? There are two beautiful chapters in 2 Corinthians about giving. Chapter 8 and 9, I believe. But in those chapters, we're told that giving is a grace. Giving is a grace. It's not done out of merit or to those necessarily deserving of receiving. Okay. It's free. Freely we have received, freely we give. No compulsion or strings attached when we give. And when we give, according to God's way of giving, we give out of love, out of a desire to give from our heart and from free will. Now, although we're talking about money and, and wealth, it's not just material or not just monetarily giving that's important here. Um, it's, it's everything else. And yet, giving of our finance often is an indicator of everything else. You know, it, I think it has been said that how you deal with your bank account and your, your wallet shows you really where your heart is. <laughs> so if you are giving in the right way, quite a lot of other things usually will follow. But I will just mention some of the other things that we must also begin. We give ourselves, we give everything that we have, our time. Some of you may not be working yet, <laughs> right? But you can give your time, yeah? You, you give of your study. What do you study? What do you read? What do you give your free time to do? Okay? Your friendships, your communications, your purchases, your traveling. I mean, every aspect of your life should be orientated towards the kingdom of God. Because the things of this world are fading fast and will fail. We are to have a kingdom mindset and an eternal perspective. Right, let's just go back and look at the last few verses of that passage in Luke because they are important. So, verse 11, chapter 16. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will trust you to true riches? So true riches are yet to come and will be distributed according to our stewardship here. Right? We're not... The money in our pockets or in our bank account is fading away. It's not true riches. But how we use that will determine how God distributes the true riches of his kingdom that is yet to come in its fullness. And verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in what is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So what we have in the here and now isn't even ours. But one day... We will be given. 
in a, in a, in a more real way. <laughs> you might think, well, it is mine. Well, no, it's not, according to the Bible. But if you steward and manage responsibly and wisely and shrewdly what you have of the currency of this world, then which belongs to, well, doesn't belong to you, <laughs> all things come from God, then one day you will be entrusted true riches. And you can look forward to that. I think it's okay to have that as an incentive. All right. And then let's look at verse 13 to 15, because this is very important. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. They ridiculed Jesus. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Friends, compromise is impossible. You cannot have a foot in both camps. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived, because I think many people are. You cannot serve God and money. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. You know, if you love money, you never have enough. It doesn't fulfill. It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It's kind of irrespective of that. Poor people can suffer from the love of money as much as rich people. The love of wealth is deceitful, addictive, and unfulfilling. Sounds a bit like drugs. <laughs> Let's turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10. One Timothy six, six to ten. Now godli godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Now, just remember, a snare is something usually that is hidden and has bait. And once you get into a snare, it's pretty difficult to get out. <laughs> and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. That is very serious words. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Very poignant, powerful words. A root of all kinds of evil. And Jesus said, to the Pharisees, you justify yourselves before men. I think that is one of the kinds of evil that comes out of the love of money. You want to justify yourself before others. There's a man pleasing. Because the love of money is connected to the world of fallen man and ultimately Satan, who's pulling the strings, because he is the god of this world, and in a sense, money makes the world go round, that which he controls anyway. The love of money also brings a man-pleasing 
attitude and bondage. But Jesus said, what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Fame, worldly fame, status, honor, prestige, pride, pride. Worldly power and influence and leverage. These things are all some of that which comes out, the many other kinds of evil from that root, that root of the love of money. You know, the root is the power base. It's where the nourishment comes that feeds the other ills. You know, if you love money, you put your security in the things of this world. It's your guarantee. It's your protection. It's your fallback rather than God. And of course, it's all utterly false and will fail. The word used here for wealth is also the word for mammon. And mammon, I'm not going to go, it's quite complicated, I think, linguistically, this word mammon. Um, But it's a spiritual entity and has real power and it has a grip, can have a grip once you give yourself to it. And those that have given themselves to the love of money often, I believe, require deliverance, spiritually speaking, because we are talking about real strongholds. So I'd like to pray. Um, I think enough shots have been fired this morning, (laughs) and I'm going to just hold fire now, I think. And I'd like us to pray. Examine our hearts. You know, if you, if you don't know Jesus yet, if you're not in his kingdom, because we're really talking about two kingdoms in conflict this morning. The kingdom that is about, uh, about the lust for money and power, control, and f- it's about fear. And the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is the kingdom of love and righteousness and truth. He calls you out of the world, in, in, in terms of the wrong world, the world that is controlled by the devil. He controls you out of, he calls you out of that and into his kingdom, which is a kingdom of truth, not deception, a kingdom that will come one day when he returns in its fullness. And so I'd like us to pray, to recommit ourselves. Maybe It might be for the very first time, but it may be for the umpteenth time. I want us to pray and commit ourselves to his kingdom and for him to show us in terms of the message that has just been delivered, to show us where the rubber hits the road for us practically and how we can extricate ourselves by his help and power from any um, tentacles that mammon or wealth in its unrighteousness may yet have a grip on us. So let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the words of Jesus to the people, both the disciples and to the Pharisees. And Father, we ask you to give us wisdom and discernment not to hide, not to make excuses or make allowances for ourselves, but to allow the penetrating truth of your word by your spirit today to get us where we need to be God and to show us with your mercy how we can be free and how we can buy into your kingdom economy as we trust in you, as we give as you want us to give, and as we put our, our whole lives into your hands, Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray for anyone here today who has yet to put their lives into your hands. 
Lord, we confess our sins. We confess our self-centeredness, which is very much a part of the culture of this world, that culture of pride and, and, and all the deceptiveness that comes through depending on worldly wealth or wanting it. Jesus, would you deliver us from all that deception and help us to see the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil for what they are? Lord, we, we renounce those things. We cut ourselves off from them in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Lord, and we give ourselves to you afresh today to run in the path of your commands, to be your servants, not dishonest managers, but honest, responsible stewards. For Lord, one day, you want to give us real wealth, for, Lord, you will return and you will put this world in order. May we be those that are ready to welcome you. In Jesus' name, amen.